Hello, hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, University of Melbourne Mid-Afternoon Masterclass as part of Science Festival. I'm Julia Claycorn and I'm going to be your host today. This is the fourth Masterclass that we've had all week, but the first that we've actually had a live audience, which is very, very exciting. It's wonderful to see you all here and to see all your faces. Um, but of course, wonderful to have a lot of people online as well. So welcome everyone. Um, so today we are broadcasting live from Science Gallery Melbourne um, and we're about to chat to Dr Mia Cobb um, and talk about some really cute puppies. Um, uh, for the event, a day in the life of your dog, friends of other animals also welcome. We do want to make that very, very clear, this is just not a dog thing. Um, so uh, before I do uh, continue, I do want to acknowledge that, um, yes, we are uh, in Science Gallery Melbourne, which is in Parkville, um, and is the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, just want to uh, acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging, um, and uh, really just acknowledge that they've been looking after this land for over 60,000 years. And this week of all weeks, it really is important to remember they are our first scientists. So, uh, today uh, we have got a wonderful presentation from Mia. Um, she'll be talking for about 25 minutes and then we'll get into some questions. Um, so they're gonna be coming from uh, in the room um, and online as well. So anyone online, please use the chat um, to put any questions you have and we'll be able to get to them uh, later on. Uh, so hi Mia, you're, you're right here. I should say hi to you as well. Hello, how are you? Hi, hi to everyone <laughs> online and in the room. It's really nice to be here. Just got to get through all the spiel, you know, all the admin. Um, all right, so I've got uh, Mia's little uh, introduction here. So I'll give everyone the spiel about who you are and why you're here. Um, so Dr Mia Cobb has worked in animal shelters and working dog facilities for over a decade, quite a while. Um, after recognising the growing importance of animal welfare to our sustainable partnerships with animals, she shifted her focus to research and to advance the welfare of Australia's working and sporting dogs. She is currently interested in how the intersections of animal welfare science human psychology, science communication and emerging technologies can help animals and people lead happier lives. That's a, that's a good combo right there. I love it. Uh, Mia's family shares their home with a large mutt named Ruby, uh, Rudy, uh, a rehomed pandemic pup called Luna and three chickens named after characters from the musical Hamilton. Now we will be taking questions at the end, but I think we all have one question and it's like, what are the names of your chickens? We have Skylar, mm -hmm. Eliza, mm. And Anne Peggy. So it's Anne Peggy, isn't it? It's not just Anne Peggy. Peggy is yeah, her name. Very, very yeah. important. If anyone knows Hamilton the Musical, that is a very key part. Wonderful. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the start, so yeah, me will be talking about 25 minutes. Um, keep your questions uh, um, in your back pocket if you're in the room um, and we'll do the traditional hands up. But as I said, anyone online, put them in the chat uh, whenever you think of them and we'll get to them at the end. Over to you, Mia. Round of applause for Mia. <laughs> Thanks everyone. It's really great to have everyone in the room, but um, also a big thank you to everyone who's joining us online. Um, so what I want to do today is show you a little bit about how science can help us live our best lives with our dogs and how um, any animal actually that you're sharing your home with, the things that we're talking about today, you can apply in the way that you're interacting with them and taking care of them at home. So most of my work has been uh, with dogs and we're lucky enough to have guide dog puppy Effie with us here in the Science Gallery today. Um, I did work at Guide Dogs Victoria for um, around about 10 years or so, and I've also worked in shelters um, as well. So I bring a very applied um, on the ground, I guess, realism to the science that I do and making sure it translates back to the real world as well. So welcome to Canine Science Week. I mean, it is Science Week, but if you want to bring any kind of science and involve dogs, you can pretty much do it. So canine science is really inclusive. Um, whether you're interested in genetics, whether you're interested in evolution, whether you're interested in maybe like the stress chemistry of dogs or how um, they influence us and our moods, canine science is a place that you can come and do that kind of research. So I just want to flag it's a fairly young field of science. It's kind of like we forgot to study dogs because they were asleep on our couches. Um, but with the event of having, you know, better camera technology, being able to do online surveys, we're learning more and more about how we live with dogs in our homes. And why should we care about animal welfare? It's a really interesting um, thing that a lot of people sort of say, well, okay, that's great. You care about animal welfare, but why should I? 
And what we've learned over the last sort of 10 or 15 years is that actually animals have feelings and you might be like, well, of course they do. I've seen my dog be happy or I've seen, you know, that cat look scared. But what we do have now after looking at their neuroanatomy, so how their brains work, looking at the chemistry in their bodies, looking at all these different things as well as their behaviour, is we now have the scientific evidence to be able to say, yes, they have feelings and those feelings matter to them. And with that understanding comes a bit of a, what we might call a moral obligation. Now that we understand it, we kind of have to make sure we're not just protecting them from being you know, treated badly or from cruelty, but also to make sure they have good experiences in their lives. And so that's becoming more relevant. And you guys might've seen things like live export of sheep or um, racing animals in the news where there's been maybe a media expose that shows us that the way people are looking after these animals doesn't align with what the community expects. And that shows us that this animal welfare and its assurance is becoming more and more important all around the world. And community attitudes have changed. That's the other thing. So we expect more now of people that are in these sort of roles of caring for animals. And that extends to how we look after them in our homes as well. So what we call that animals having feelings is sentience. And it's a funny word, but basically it is that recognizing that animals have feelings that matter to them. And they can vary from being very negative. So being scared or fearful or really hungry, and they can be really positive. So like feeling good because you've had a play with a friend, feeling nice and safe and comfortable and warm and with a full tummy. Now, one of the things I did when I was doing my PhD research was ask people, how do you perceive the welfare of dogs in different situations? And so I reckon I can probably guess if I asked you to line up from the best welfare to the worst welfare, and when we're thinking about welfare, think about quality of life or how they experience things, a guide dog, maybe an unowned street dog that's living somewhere in the world, and someone else's pet dog, and a racing greyhound, that probably, even if you don't know much about how those dogs all live, you've got a bit of a gut feeling. When I asked over 2,000 people around the world this, this is what they told me, that they reckon the guide dogs have got really good level of welfare. The other people's pet dogs kind of is in the middle, and then racing greyhounds, and then maybe the dogs that don't have such great welfare are the ones that are living away from people. And so there's this kind of thing about when they're closer to people, we think they've got better welfare. And I just want you to really think about that because that's kind of what we're going to delve into a little bit here. I think probably the dogs down that end are really well fed and have really good health care. But I think maybe our free ranging dog friends have some things that we could learn from and apply to the animals that are living with us. <laughs> there was one exception. And when I asked this question, I asked it about 17 different categories of dogs. When I asked people to rate their own dog's welfare, guess what happened? <laughs> Everyone's dog had the best welfare ever. And now there's a really good chance that maybe only people who took good care of their dogs answered my survey, but I don't know that 2,000 people can all have the dog with the best welfare. And what's interesting about this is that when we do this kind of self-assessment and see this better than average effect, it also happens when we rate ourselves as drivers and when we rate ourselves as parents. But this was the first time we saw it in relation to looking after animals. And it's important because it means we might be missing some opportunities to make their lives better because we think they've already got it perfect. So thinking about how we're in control of everything for the animals that live with us. We're in control of what they eat and when they eat it. We're in control of where they sleep. We're in control of who they can play with, where they can go, and who they get to see as well. The free ranging dogs, on the other hand, have a lot of what we call agency. They get to make their own choices in their lives. <clears throat> and when documentary people have followed those kind of dogs around, they see that they move around quite a bit. They interact with lots of different people and animals and places. They have what we call social freedom, sexual freedom as well as environmental freedom. And so it's interesting because dogs can live and be in charge of all those kind of decisions for themselves. So how can we take some of that engagement and agency and, and bring it to the animals that are in our homes? 
because we know that having choices like this is really important to how we feel well, particularly the people in Melbourne. Because when we had COVID lockdowns and we weren't allowed to go where we wanted to go and we weren't allowed to see the people that we wanted to see, it impacted how we felt. It impacted our well-being. And that relief we had when lockdowns ended and we could suddenly go out and be where we wanted to be and see who we wanted to see felt really, really good. But think about that and think about the feeling of the dogs that are living in our homes. Another fact you might not know, and raise your hand if you do for the people in here, maybe I'll take some guesses actually. How many dogs do you think, if we're taking a percentage of dogs in the world, how many do you think don't live in homes with us? How many do you think are free ranging dogs? What percent? Yep. 47%, that's a solid guess. Are we getting any online guesses as well, Julia? 20, 66, 90, 20, all, 66. All, all over. All right, well, actually it's around 80% of the world's 900 million dogs are not living in our homes with us. I know, right? Amazing. Um, so what I wanna do is go back and look a little bit at the research about how we think about animals. Because at the end of the day, if we wanna change their lives, it's actually our behavior probably that needs to change. So lots of things influence how we think about animals. And while I'm talking, I want you to look at this picture. Don't say anything out loud yet. Just Think about what you see. So community standards and expectations that we mentioned just before, they influence how we think, what we've grown up with as being normal, influences how we think about animals. Our personal experience, so whether you've grown up with an animal in the home, which unfortunately Julia didn't, but we'll forgive her. Whether we've worked with animals, um, whether we've had any specific education about animals, so perhaps you trained to be a veterinarian and you've learnt about animals that way the attitudes of people around us. So we put a lot of weight on the attitudes from our family and our friends, and also other professional opinions that might get shared with us. So that might be from your vet or a dog trainer, or perhaps something you've seen on TV. Now, looking at that, can I get a raise of hands here? And people online, feel free to pop in the comment. Who saw a frog? Okay, so we've probably got about 60% of the audience. And if you saw something out else, yell out what it was on three, two, one. Horse. Oh. Horse. <laughs> so based on your own experience, even though you all had the same thing in front of you, you saw two different really things. Okay, and I think that's a great example that we need to be mindful of when we're looking at our animals in front of us and thinking about how happy they are, is that based on our background, we can attend to different things that are in front of us. And so that's really important for a couple of reasons. As scientists, we need to be really objective. So we need to try and leave all that behind, all those things that influence our thinking and be as objective as we can, because we wanna know the truth or as close as we can get to it. And that's really important when we are thinking about the experience of others. So I've spared you the actual video footage, but this girl on the left, there's two, two girls, one's over here on the left of the screen, one's in the middle. They've both jumped off the roof of the building aiming for the pool. Her friend just makes it. Unfortunately, this girl has miscalculated. She's about to hit the concrete, break both her feet and ankles. There's follow-up video with her in a wheelchair. She does fine. Um, but it's not hard for us to understand her experience. We're people, she's a person. We can look at that. I can tell you she's about to break both her feet and we can understand her next few seconds, her next few hours and her next few weeks. They're not gonna be the best experience of her life. Okay, we can understand that really easily. When we look at the photo of the bunny lying in the grass, it's harder for us to know what that animal is experiencing right now. It could just be relaxing in the sun, or it could also have two broken legs. It's a prey animal, so it's not gonna yell and scream and draw attention to itself. And so we need to be careful about assessing what its experience might be at the moment. And so as scientists, we rely on a whole range of tools to do this. 
Um, I've been involved in research that looks at dog spit to help us understand how stressed or not stressed they are. And in fact, the study that I worked with with some colleagues overseas pulled together about five litres of dog spit from about 5,000 different dogs to understand what it tells us as a measure of stress. But it's also important to look at behaviour as well. So in kennel environments, which is where I've done a lot of my work with different um, working dog groups, things like detector dogs or dogs that are living in kennel facilities, we often see dogs that are doing this barking and jumping and they might be the dogs that we think are, are stressing out. When we look at their physiology or their body chemistry, actually sometimes those dogs are doing better job of coping because of all those behaviours that they're doing to get their feelings out. And sometimes it's the quiet dog that's sitting in the corner that's actually more distressed. So it's really important that we use a range of measures. And one of the things that's emerging now with a whole lot of different animal species from bees to birds to dogs is what we call cognitive bias testing. And that's what the urine's <laughs> representing. We do do a lot of spit, wee and poo in, in animal science. Um, but that's looking at how optimistic or pessimistic animals are. And so that's, if you've had a good life, you expect good things to keep happening. And that's a glass half full kind of attitude. If you've had bad things, you tend to be more pessimistic. So you think more bad things are gonna happen. So there's lots of cool ways that we can ask animals what they want, what they prefer, and to understand indicators of how they're feeling. We can't actually know how they feel because we're not animals, but we can rely on these indicators. So think about how you're feeling today. What influences it? I am feeling really great because I get to share my science with you and that always makes me excited. I've had lots of coffee, which is also really good. It's not too cold in this room. I'm feeling really comfortable. I made a good choice in footwear, so my shoes are nice and comfy. Um, and I'm here with a whole lot of friends, which is also a really nice experience for me. I didn't have a cat waking me up in the middle of the night. I didn't have a baby that was keeping me up three or four times to feed it. So I've had a great rest. But when you think about how you're feeling, it's all these little decisions and things that you think about that determines when I say, how are you, how you respond. And that's kind of the same approach we take when we're thinking about the welfare of animals. So we use something called the five domains model. And what that does is look at positive and negative experiences an animal has across these four domains. Nutrition, so are they hungry, thirsty? Are they, are they getting food and water? Um, their physical environment, and that might be something like temperature or airflow or having a comfortable bed to lie on. Their health, so have they got an itch or a sore? Um, are they on a, a vaccination program? Those kind of things. And then looking at the fourth domain is behavioural interactions. And that's their interactions with other animals, with people and with their environment. And each of those four domains feeds into the fifth domain, which is the mental experience or mental state of an animal. And from that, we can understand its welfare state overall. And so this changes over time, and this is a great diagram from our friends at um, Zoo and Aquarium Association of Australasia that they've let me share, that looks at an animal in a zoo exhibit, for example, and over time, how its welfare shifts from being in the positive area to maybe having moments where things aren't so great. So it could be that you're exploring and that's really enjoyable. Um, there's a loud noise that gives you a moment of feeling frightened, so your welfare goes into the negative area. Then you um, get involved with some grooming with a friend and that makes you feel good and so on and so forth. So our welfare is always going up and down, just like ours is in any given day as well, depending on what's happening around us. But what we're aiming for when we're providing a good life to animals is having more experiences above the line in the positive welfare area than below it. And so it's this area of interactions with people and other animals and our environment and how that relates to our mental experience or the mental experience of animals that I want us to think about today. And I'm gonna give you some tips that you can apply at home in problem solving for your own home and your own animal to give them the best life that you can. So first of all, we need to really um, acknowledge that animals live in a really different world to us. Physically, if you want to understand what your home looks like to your dog, get down on the ground, be at their height, look at what they see. But we also need to recognise that dogs, cats, other animals have a different sensory experience to us. 
So dogs in particular, where we live in a really visual world, they live in a really smell-based world. So they see with their noses. They're constantly smelling things that are arriving and leaving a space. They can tell how long we've been gone because our smell dissipates the longer we've been gone. And so th remembering things like that, maybe you've got music blaring and you've noticed your dog always takes itself off to the bedroom when that happens, um, or when you are cooking something really strong that they're really interested, um, is understanding that they're living in quite a different sensory world to us. So coming back to think about our free-ranging friend and all that agency and the choices and control and, and challenges. And when I talk about challenges, they're, they're challenges that are not like a brick wall, right? They're challenges you can overcome, but are things that um, keep you occupied. So like our guide dog friend down here was chewing on a bone just before a toy that was keeping her occupied because she's young. And this is, you know, not the funnest gig for her to be sitting at. So she's getting practice at chewing and relaxing in a space that's new to her with people around. And that's something that's challenging for her. And this is helping her cope really well in the environment. So we can think about how can we provide choices and offer our animals control? And this might sound crazy. Um, I'm not expecting you to let your dog drive the car, but maybe things like, you know, can you give them the choice of being inside or outside? Can you give them control over that by putting a doggy door in? So then they have the choice of whether they're inside or outside. Can you make sure that you've got more dog beds around or cat beds around than there are actually numbers of animals living in your house? so that they have a choice of where they put themselves. Can you make sure that a door is open to a bedroom so that if things get too loud or if there's too many visitors, they can choose to opt out and go somewhere else? Those are the kind of things you can think about. Maybe it's as simple as going on a walk and letting them pick which way to go and let them sniff their way around the block rather than hustling on a power walk. They're the kind of things we know that sniffing for dogs is like really makes them feel good. And it can also be whether they wanna be patted or not. So one interesting study looked at when we invite dogs over to us to be patted, rather than going over to them and starting to pat them, the interactions with the dogs last for longer, the dogs are happier, and generally the person ends up feeling happier as well. So some quick ideas, if you're not sure how you could apply this at home. One of the easiest things to think about is how you feed your animals. And it doesn't have to happen just in a food bowl. So one of the things I do if I'm about to leave the house, we have two dogs at my house and we will put um, either just literally take handfuls of their breakfast and throw it around the backyard and then leave them to sniff and find it or hide it in little like piles around the place while the dogs are inside and then they have to come out and use their nose and actually explore. And so that gives them an activity that lets them use their noses, it occupies their time and it feeds them. And that's something that is giving them more of that choice um, more of that challenge that they find really rewarding and generally by the time they're finished doing that they're really happy just to lie down and relax for a bit because they've had an activity as well and if you've got a cat you can do the same sort of thing around hiding it around the inside of the house or if you've got a rat you can do it as well um other things that i'd like you to think about i guess thinking about those domains and how it influences the mental experiences things that perhaps you know you can think about different angles. So in terms of environment, you can think vertically, right? You can think about um, how can you provide lookout places for cats that are up, not just down around on the ground. And dogs actually really like elevated lookouts as well. So can you safely provide somewhere that's a platform they can sit up on and look around? Some people drill holes in their fences so that their dogs can go up and like actually peek out and see what's going on around them. And things like dressing up our dogs actually probably doesn't feel great to the dogs. So thinking about how would you feel if you were forced into something like a wetsuit that you didn't really opt into that interaction and looking at their behavior. So the things that show me this dog's not really happy with this situation, <laughs> it's really tight through its mouth. Its eyes are kind of bugging out. And I don't think it's just because of its skull shape. Um, its ears look all squished and uncertain and the paws, it's really tense. So that dog's not enjoying that experience. And now that we understand about dogs being sentient, we probably put, shouldn't put them in situations like that just to entertain us. That's probably not really okay anymore. Oops, too far. Um, 
The other thing we can do is how we interact with our animals. So animals like dogs and cats are learning every single time they interact with us. They are gonna do things that get them outcomes they like. And if that means ripping up a pillow, like my dog did this morning in my lounge room, got my attention, I've actually reinforced that behavior because that worked. She was bored, she found something to do and it got my attention and wow, what a great game that is. So, you know, as hard as it can be, we need to think about every interaction we're having with our animals. How can we be kind? How can we be positive and actually pay attention to them when they're doing the right thing to encourage that behavior rather than relying on telling them off when they're doing the wrong thing. And when we offer them choice, like, would you like that pat? Would you like to come to me for a pat? That actually builds their trust and their attachment to us. So we know that our animals form attachments to us the same way that babies do to their mothers. And that trust is a really big part of that. There are some great resources if you wanna learn more about cat or dog behavior. There's an artist called Lily Chin who does amazing um, creative commons diagrams and has a book that you can look at and learn more about. <laughs> We're getting close to the end now, so I want you to remember um, that animals are individuals. On the left are my two dogs, and you could not get two different animals. So Rudy at the back is nine. He's very sensible. He's very well behaved. Luna at the front is very a lot. <laughs> She's super energetic. She has a very short attention span. She's very busy. Um, and you know, every dog is an individual. So I would encourage you all to watch the behavior of the animals that you live with and get to know them as individuals. What works well for one may be completely irrelevant to the other. And so because of this, you're gonna need to be scientists. You're gonna need to test your ideas and really watch how they react and respond and then change your behavior accordingly. And as scientists, that's what we're doing all the time. We test ideas, we watch what works, what doesn't, and then we change what we do. And the good thing in doing this with your animals is that when we give them their best lives, we generally benefit as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, round of applause for Mia. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating and definitely coming from a, a non-pet owner yes i admit it um that was very fascinating um because i definitely live in a suburb where uh, it feels like everyone else has a, a dog so i definitely see lots of dogs and pets around so um thank you so much that was amazing and i think i i, I mean i loved your final point um really where it's reaching out and saying to anyone that uh is a pet owner they are a scientist in itself, um, just to improve their care of their dog as well. So that's great. Nice little uh, uh, important point for, for National Science Week. Um, all right, so on to Q&A time. So um, everyone in the room, put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Also um, online, please um, add any of your questions to the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, so we've got a few questions coming through, but I do want to, I'm going to be sneaky and start it off. Um, because I, you know, I just think it's really um, important to hear from you, I guess, just in terms of what brought you into this field. It'd be nice just to set the, set the scene a little bit more. I mean, I don't think we, anyone would argue that this is not a fascinating area and we'd love to be part of it as well, but what's your, what's your reason? It's a really good question and one that I'm always fascinated with as well, because so many different pathways can lead to being a scientist. Um, so for myself, growing up, I was always really interested in animal behaviour. I knew that I wanted to do something with animals. I wasn't sure that veterinary science was what I wanted to do. And so I did a Bachelor of Science degree at university and majored in both um, zoology, so studying animals and animal behaviour, and also psychology, which is another pathway to understanding animal behaviour. So I did a double major. And then I went off and backpacked around the world. <laughs> and got in really big credit card debt <laughs> and came back. And the first job that I got was working in a shelter just as an animal attendant. But what that did was really put a fire in my belly for animal welfare because I saw all the different ways that our relationships with animals can break down. Um, I was working at an RSPCA shelter and we saw all the cruelty cases coming through. Mm. We saw abandoned animals, we saw stray animals um, and we saw the adoptions. Mm. Um, but it really made me passionate about advocating for animals and it's really important we do that with evidence. And so that's where we need science to help guide best practice and policies and things like that. And so after working uh, in the shelter environment, I was like, lucky enough to go work at guide dogs 
which was such a positive environment. <laughs> um, and what we saw there was that, you know, sometimes young puppies that were coming in to start their training were getting a bit stressed with that change of environment. And so we wanted to know, well, what can we do to um, make that better? And so I started a part-time PhD while I was working there and went back to university part-time looking at this question of how can we improve the kennel environment to better support these dogs so that they can succeed and be happy. And um, then I went on maternity leave, <laughs> kept plodding away at the PhD. I had a second baby and kept plodding away at the PhD and finally finished. And then I've returned to academia. So along the way, I've also done consultations with um, working dog groups in industries. And I've worked on some federal government projects looking at the welfare of dogs in Australia from farm dogs to government dogs um, and racing dogs as well. So um, yeah, I think it's just really good because everyone does have a different pathway generally to being a scientist. It doesn't always have to be straight. Mm. Um, and particularly, you know, things like having families and things like that can, can make for a slightly different journey, but you know, you can get there. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. And I just love how you've, every step of the way, each experience is sort of fed into the next stage as well. So it's really nice how, yeah, um, the path just keeps winding its way along. So that's fascinating. Um, all right. So thank you. Thank you for answering that, um, setting the scene. So we'll get into some questions. I'll start off with one online. Um, and uh, I guess it goes a little bit to some of the, the welfare experience, um, perhaps. Um, so the, the question is, why are dogs triggered by some breeds of dogs more so than others? Uh, excellent. So um, I guess when we're looking at behaviour of animals, it's often a combination of genetics, but also their lived experience. Mm. And particularly with dogs, they have in their early weeks and months of lives, what we call a socialisation period. And that's where you can expose them to lots of things in a positive way to set them up to be more resilient in the future. But if a dog hasn't perhaps met a certain breed of dog, mm. or they've had a bad experience with mm. one that looked like that, yeah. in that early socialization period or even later they're going to carry that with them for a long time and we mm. don't always know when we get a puppy what's happened beforehand what they have or haven't experienced mm. and so it's possible if you're seeing a dog that is really reactive to I don't know let's say every time it sees a Labrador it freaks out mm. um, it could be because it never saw a Labrador or maybe one was a bit you know too much with it when it was younger mm. Mm. My big shaggy dog identifies as a golden retriever. He <laughs> thinks that they're his people. When he sees them, he's like, yeah, hi, and goes bowling up to them. And they're often like, whoa, you're really big and gray and shaggy. Um, but that's just, he seems to think that's his people. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, and, and it goes in a number of ways. It actually reminds me that when uh, my auntie had a little cat and when I was quite young, we came to visit her and the cat got really, really scared. And that was the first time they realised that the cat was probably quite scared of very young kids because they hadn't been exposed to any kids before or possibly have, I don't know. Or maybe I was super scary, I'm not sure. Yeah, and a good thing to overcome that, I guess if you're in that situation, is oh, yes, try please. and pair positive things with that experience. So mm. if you did have a dog that was scared of Labradors, for example, or didn't like them, find a friendly one through yeah. someone that you know, and maybe get them to not come too close, but maybe 10 metres away, and then give your dog some really nice high value treats and try and make that emotional response to that trigger a positive one rather than a negative one. So great, great tips, um, amazing. Okay, um, on to the next question. Uh, I'll do another one online. So anyone in the room, please um, also uh, contribute with questions if you'd like. So April has a question, um, oh, about becoming a dog groomer. So is it hard to become one and do some dogs prefer grooming over others? Oh, okay, so a choice of like whether the dogs like it or not. Um, I think in terms of training to be a dog groomer, there are a few different pathways you can do that. Mm. So I think you can um, get some experience through TAFE or through sort of learning with a groomer. I don't think there's necessarily a formal accreditation program within that industry as with many animal related things like dog training as well. Um, and I think, again, all dogs are individuals, so some will probably enjoy grooming if they've had really positive grooming experiences their whole lives, and some may have had bad experiences and be a bit more reluctant, and you just have mm. to go a bit slower and pair it with treats and yeah. you know, make, convince them that it is a good thing. Mm, yeah. So first two questions quite connected. This is great. Well done, well done team. Um, okay, so on to, I guess, broadening broadening our thoughts to other animals. And I know we asked in the room before, um, the dog people, the cat people, we had a fish, um, a, a favourite fish animal as well. Um, uh, the favourite was a fish animal, anyway. Uh, do you know if these approaches work with reptiles and other non-mammals? 
Yes. <laughs> yep. So learning theory um, and understanding animal welfare, that five domains model, we use that with all animals. So we use that in zoos with reptiles and with um, birds and yep, with lots of different animals. And we're learning more and more every year. So, I mean, one of the things we've learned in the last few years is that it's really important for snakes to be able to fully stretch out their full length in an enclosure. Mm. And that's changed the way that we provide space for snakes and how we regulate yeah. for that. So there's little things like that we're learning all the time. And I mm. guess, you know, a lot of the research has focused on how animals help people mm. um, and not as much about how animals are experiencing the way we're living with them. And probably, I guess, you know, there's a real need for more funding into that side of things, especially in areas like therapy dogs are exploding at the moment. And if we want to regulate that space and, and do that really well, we need the evidence to understand how dogs are experiencing those kind of things mm. or birds or reptiles. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess on that, is there is there a reason why I think focus has been on one way than the other so far? I think people just tend to make it all about ourselves. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it is really important, particularly when we're relying on animals to do important jobs, mm. to understand how we can help them do it in a way that makes them as happy as possible while we're also helping. And there's a whole movement of One Health and One Welfare that really looks at that interconnectedness of how when we're doing well and animals are doing well and the environment's doing well, everyone's better off. Mm, yeah. Um, and I do feel like that's changing quite a bit. Like, I know I'm not, I'm not a pet owner, but I do see a lot of pets around, as I said, and I feel like I can see owners treating their dogs very differently where it's not about pulling them in the one direction, but it's walking with the dog and allowing, like, to, allowing the dog to guide where they're going in the direction as well. That makes me so happy to hear. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. doing those kind of sniffy walks, that is one of the simplest things mm. we know that makes dogs really happy. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to give some space for the audience. Yes, okay, amazing. We've got uh, an, a question um, in the front here. Hi, thanks so much for that lovely talk. I'm not a pet owner myself, but I could relate a lot with what you've spoken here. I hear you. Um, yeah. So uh, my question was uh, when you were emphasizing on the good experiences versus bad experiences influencing their behavior, I was just wondering if dogs are born with an innate perception of what humans are like, and if that changes with the 80% of those which mm. live by themselves and 20% which are owned as pets? It's a great question, mm. this kind of role that domestication has had on dogs and how we relate to each other. So there's some good research that's happened over, um, well, different parts of the world, in the US, but also in Europe, where they've had like groups of wolves and groups of dogs and they've asked them the same kind of questions. So they've set them up and said, you know, how do you react when a person points to show you where food is hidden? And, you know, do the dogs pay more attention than wolves? And we can see that that kind of behavior is a learned response. So if you've had lots of um, interaction with people pointing with their finger at something, you're more likely to understand what it means. Um, and wolves that have grown up in the wild may not innately understand that. But if we take wolves that are living in captive environments and we teach them that, they can learn it readily. Dingoes in Australia, interestingly, kind of fall in the middle of what we notice in the thinking styles of all these canids. So we've got wolves that are kind of um, very persistent in problem solving on their own. We have dingoes that are kind of in the middle. And then we have dogs that when we give them a hard problem, they just stop and look at the person. <laughs> so it is learned and there is I guess that role of domestication and there are scientists that are looking deeply into that um, to understand the way it's influenced how they think and how they relate to us. We know that they can read our expressions um, when they're looking at pictures, we know that they can smell um, the, the hormones and the, the chemicals in our body that change when we're experiencing different moods. Um, so there's yeah there's definitely a lot going on. Sure. Thank you. Great question. Um, and thank you so much. So I'll go back to one online just to keep it even, but please, anyone um, in the audience, uh, just put up your hand, we'll come back to you. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, a couple online. So does de-sexing actually affect the territorial behaviour of male dogs, like growling at male oh, dogs, marking territory? Such a good question. And one we're looking into Four more, hours. this effect of de-sexing, when de-sexing is done, how it might influence all range of behaviours and health. Um, I'd say probably in that situation, chat to your vet about the latest information um, because it is such a shifting space at yeah, the moment right. and we're learning more every month pretty much so your vet should be on top of the latest research and be able to guide you in that yeah okay amazing um oh question at the back 
Thank you. That's very interesting, Mia. I've, I have a dog. Um, <laughs> she's a D6 uh, female, but she marks her territory when we go for a walk, like every 30 metres. How normal or otherwise is that behaviour? <laughs> Some people call it the P-male. <laughs> so she's not necessarily marking her territory in terms of telling other dogs, this is where I live, bugger off. Um, it could just be like a calling card to say, hey, I've been through here. You can now smell that I've been through here. I'm going to sniff over there where you left your calling card as well. Um, so I would say, you know, every 30 metres or so, again, if you're concerned it's too frequent, get your vet to check her out that she doesn't have some kind of urinary tract infection. Um, but otherwise, you know, urinating is one of the ways they communicate. It's a very smell-based way of communicating. So they can't kind of um, leave a graffiti tag. Instead, they're leaving urine marking um, as a way of saying, I'm, I hang out in this area. Awesome. Thank you for the question. Um, all right, another one online. We've only got uh, sort of three or so minutes left. So last couple of questions. So from Karen, um, in dogs, is the amount of sleep an indicator of well-being and happiness? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> and again, it's complicated, right? Mm. Um, and it's something that we uh, hasn't been given a lot of scientific attention relating to dogs, but we're learning more and more. So it depends. So um, sleep can be, it's really important to learning in training. We know that. Um, but what we also know is that sometimes if animals aren't given enough to do, they can kind of fall into this over relaxed state, what we call mm. um, awake inertia, which is kind of like you're so bored that you just kind of mm. tuned out of life. Mm. And so you're kind of almost catatonic. Mm. Um, and so just because your dog's sleeping the day away on the couch doesn't mean they wouldn't prefer to be doing other things as well, mm. given the choice. Um, so sleep can be healthy. It's really important to learning and getting good sleep is important, but I would say sleeping 23 hours a day is probably not the best life for a dog. Mm. I guess, uh, and a lot of these answers, uh, that does seem to be a parallel to humans, because I do feel like sometimes maybe I'm on the couch and I'm like, I probably could be doing other things right now. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Uh, so, uh, oh, anything in person? person no okay all right we've got one online awesome um so from sarah thank you do you have any tips to help calm a territorial dog uh good question uh, distraction is great so try and give them something better i'm assuming by territorial maybe mm. we're talking about barking down a fence line mm. or running or being quite reactive so distraction can be great um giving them something either like a puzzle toy stuffed with food or um, something else to focus on or teaching them a behavior that means they can't do that other thing so for example, like an example of that is, you know, when I walk in, our young dog likes to jump up on me. But what I've taught her to do is sit and I'll come and pat you. And you can't jump up on me if you're sitting really nicely in your bed. So try and teach something that's incompatible. So maybe mm. another way I've heard of this used is someone taught their dog, if there was a snake, they live in Queensland, to hop on your bed, right? So you, you can't interact with the snake if you know every time you see or smell one, you hop on your bed. And one day she got home and she was like, come on, let's go inside. And the dog was like, nope, I'm staying on my bed. Mm. She's like, come on. And like after a couple of minutes, she's like, oh, and looked around and sure enough, there was a carpet python um, up behind the barbecue. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So trying to teach her um, either distracting through something fun like toys or food-based things or teaching an incompatible behaviour. Mm. Amazing. Um, all right. Well, um, we've skated to 2.45. So um, I will just uh, ask you maybe one final question because I'd love to. There's been so many amazing tips and amazing questions. So thank you to everyone. Um, I guess I'd love to know, like it was an amazing presentation about all the different things that are happening, but what what are we on the brink of? Like what, what is the next step for this sort of area? And I guess in a sense, what is your next step in terms of what is the, um, yeah, the next step in this sort of research area? Yeah, look, I think there's some really basic fundamentals that we haven't done for dogs. So it would be great to get research funded in that area that would let us develop, you know, better ways of assessing the canine experience. So whether that's coming up with um, a good way to assess stress so that we can help guide best practice in things like therapy dogs um, or other working dogs as well. Um, but also, yeah, there's just some fundamental, it's, it's weird. We know more about what chickens like and what chickens need for a good life than we do about dogs. So um, there's some really basic work to be done in that space. And I'm excited for that groundwork to get done and then see where we can go from there.
Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mia. Um, this has been a fascinating talk, as you all uh, agree. Um, so many amazing tips um, and so fascinating. So, And thank you, audience, for coming in as well and everyone online. I think we were pushing 150 at one point. So um, a huge audience. Um, we're all pet fans, no doubt. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, uh, we have, as I said, this is our fourth masterclass. We've got one more tomorrow. It's with uh, Dr. Sonia Needs. Uh, she will be telling us why different food, foods taste wonderful together. So it's a wonderful way to wrap up the week. Um, but, uh, oh yes, and also Science Festival and National Science Week hasn't finished either. So please check out um, uh, what else is happening. We'll be putting some links in the chat. And also I think some resources are gonna be posted there as well. So everyone online, um, check all that out. So that's it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank uh, you. It's been amazing to chat. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Round of applause and see everyone at two o'clock uh, tomorrow.